23rd Psalm, 23rd Psalm. All right, say it like you mean it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. That's a great verse. It simply says, the Lord is my shepherd. Say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Take ownership of that. My shepherd. That's what we've got to know. No, the Lord is not a shepherd. He is your shepherd. So take ownership of God. The Lord is my shepherd. Not was, not will be. He is your shepherd. That means that you shall not want. That means he is your provider. God is your provision. Whatever you would ever desire, whatever you would be lacking, God has it. He knows what's missing in your life. He knows what's lacking. If anything is lacking, you ask God. He is your provider. Fear today, fear. Our greatest motivators, the first one, what's the greatest motivation you think for people to do things? Fear. No, that's number two. Pleasure. Yes, pleasure. That's our greatest motivation. We do things that we like. If we like it, we do it. If we like it a lot, we do it again and again and again. The problem with pleasure is that we can become self-centered so that everything is about our liking. Everything is about us. We become centered so much on us that we miss what's outside of us. And there are some blessings that are outside of us, right? That means we have to deny ourselves sometimes to get what God has for us. But if we always look at that stuff that we like, we're missing it because some things are right there outside of stuff that we cannot see at face value. Some things you will love if you could just neglect what you see. Because beyond what you see is God's favor. We miss the favor of God because we judge what we saw, we judge what we heard, we judge who the person was, and we miss what God was trying to bring us. Because we were centering on self. So it's not always about what we like. Pleasure is what drives a lot of people. I like this church. I like the people here. I like the music. I like the pastor. I like the food. But when you don't like something, you go and try to find somewhere else where you like it. But ultimately, if we start seeing that God is in everything, you start loving everything. You can never have a bad day when God's in your life. God will take your worst things and turn them into your best things. Things that turn starts out bad, God just turns around and makes it turn out for good. We've got to be careful not to speak the things that we don't want to happen to our existence. Sometimes we can speak it and what we say comes to pass. Job says, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me and what I, and what I dreaded has happened to me. What you focus on, you think about. What you think about, you bring about. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8, think on these things. Whatever things that are good and right and true and honest, of good report, if there's anything that's praiseworthy, think on those things. Don't think about the bad times and bad things and the negatives. Focus on the positives. Keep it positive. Keep your thoughts on things that are above. That's what God admonished us. Think about what is above and not what is beneath. Not what is beneath. Fear, the acronym for fear is false what? Evidence appearing real. A uh, couple others is forget everything and run. <laughs> or face everything and rise. One of our greatest enemies, one of our greatest enemies. And one of the weapons that Satan uses the most is fear. Fear will control your life if you allow it to. Fear. You notice a lot of commercials and marketing, they pull on the uh, string of fear or pleasure. How great something is, they sell you on how good it is, how wonderful it will be for you, 
or the fear of not having something and what the consequences could be. Judges chapter number seven. Now this was when Gideon was told that he was going to be the one that God was going to use to free the people from the Midianites. So Gideon was not the most favorite person. In fact, Gideon had every reason to fear. He was a little guy and he was small in stature. He wasn't well known. He was more of a coward. In fact, when the angel was speaking to Gideon, Gideon was hiding down threshing wheat. So there was nothing about Gideon that said that he was a mighty man of valor. But when, when the angel said, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, Gideon had to think you can't not be talking about me. Because there's nothing about us that makes God, that makes us want what God wants. But when God sees you, he sees the potential in us. He doesn't see the person that we are. He sees what we're capable of becoming if we allow ourselves to be used by him. And Gideon allowed himself to be used by God. And then he had him to bring all the people together and he was going to sort out the people. And here's the first thing that God used as a measuring line between the people. So in Judges chapter number seven, verse number three. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So that means two thirds of the people were afraid. Even though God has says, I will be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Yes, God, but I'd rather go back. You know what an insult it is to God when God has already said that he's with you and you turn back and allow fear to control? You're saying, God, I, I know you can do this, but the fear rules you. And God did not give us that spirit of fear. So when we're allowing the fear to consume our lives, we're not being led by God. Because God will lead us in the place where we need him most. And that place where we need him most is the place where we're the weakest. And if fear is a thing we need to develop and grow in that area, he'll lead you to places where you have to stay, be still and see the salvation of God. You understand that? Unless God puts you in a place where you will get to see his strength and his power, you'll always back down because of fear. And you'll miss the, the presence and favor of God that he's trying to show in your life. He shows up mightily when we're weakest. We have our greatest deficit. That's when God shows his strength and his might and his power. When the doctors give up on you, when everybody else has given up on you, and there's nothing else you can do and you have this fear. But in the midnight hour, God says, right now, I am going to save you. I'm going to turn you back. I'm going to add 15, 20, 30 years to your life. That's what God does. It's God that turns people around. When you're at your worst, know that God has not said what everybody else is saying. God may use everybody else's words to prove his might in you. Another time that happened is when they were marching around Jericho. As they were marching around Jericho, he says, I want everyone that's marching around to be still and not utter one word. You know, when you're going through a trial and tribulations, it's difficult not to let something come out of your mouth. Because we would talk every fear, we would speak everything into existence rather than just being still and not speak. So many times it would be better if we had not spoken at those times. There's things that we have said that have marked destiny and changed direction in your life. If we could have just not said those things and be still. Second Chronicles 20, 15. And, and then he said, listen, all you Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but who? But God's. So whenever you're outnumbered, outmanned, and there's no way, you remember whose battle it is. You're not fighting your battle. As a child of God, you're, not, you're never fighting your battle. The battle is always God's. Whenever something attacks your flesh or something attacks your marriage or your children or attacks you personally, they're not attacking you, they're attacking God. And God will commission the army of heaven to come and stand on your behalf. You are never alone. Just because you don't see what you want to see, do not deny God. God is trying to work on your behalf. Do not fear, be encouraged, stand strong. The Bible says, and see the salvation of the Lord. The battle is not yours. The battle is God's. Fear is a choice. We choose to be afraid. 
You know, there's two fears that we're born with, so I've heard the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. The rest of our fears are learned. We learn all of those fears. Think about children, children, babies even. They're not afraid of spiders or snakes or the boogeyman or all that stuff. We learn those things. We learn those things. Second Timothy chapter number one, verses number six and verse number seven. This is uh, Paul's words to Timothy. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you. Now, that's the first thing. The gift of God. When you are active in the gift of God, you have boldness. Whatever you do with God's favor, you do it with boldness. There's no fear when you know that you're doing what God has called you to do. You're standing in a place where God wants you to stand right now, and you will not fear. As long as you're doing God's will, God will give you strength and courage, and he will make sure that you have what you need to fulfill the journey. There are fears when we're outside of God. We know where we should be, but we're somewhere else. And we want God to protect us over there. Your protection is in doing what God has called you to do. That's what your provision is, doing what God has called you to do. If you would just do what God wants, God will give you more than enough. Whatever you need, God will supply that. But if you want God to bless your, your adventure, something that you want to do over here, but you do not want to be in the place where God wants you to be, God will not bless a mess. You have to be willing to do what God wants. God will bless the direction and the blessing and favor is on the place where you're supposed to be. Where are you supposed to be right now? Where are you supposed to be in ministry, in your life, in your calling? Everyone here has a call of God. And if you don't want to fulfill that call, then you're missing the blessing because the blessing is on the call. The favor is at the call. Whatever you're doing, you may, you, may be, you may be benefiting somewhat, but God says right here is blessed, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. More than you could ever receive as long as you're doing God's will. But if we don't want to do God's will, we're going to get outside of that ark of safety and we're going to struggle. We're going to struggle. But God's not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Three things I want you to know. First one, God did not give it to us. The fear that you have did not come from God. Remember, we, we learn those things. God did not give us fear. He told us all throughout the word of God, be encouraged. Over a hundred times in scripture says, do not fear. Be encouraged. Stand, be of good courage. He gives us the words to say that we have no need to back down. He did not give it to us. Secondly, it is a spirit. God does not give us the spirit of fear. It is a spirit. And if it's a spirit, that means it yields to other spirits, right? Every spirit yields to a greater spirit. And every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess to what? The name of Jesus, right? Every spirit, even when those spirits, those demoniacs, the people that were possessed, whenever they saw Jesus, what did those spirits do? They came and they fell down at Jesus' feet. No matter how bad those people were, they were in graveyards. One of the one guy was cutting himself with stones and had chains. He was out of his mind. But when he saw Jesus, he ran and he fell down at the feet of Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Everything you have, every condition has a name. Cancer has a name. Diabetes has a name. AIDS has a name. Emphysema has a name. Everything has a name, but that name must yield to the name that is above every name. Every name. If you fear your condition more than you fear God, your condition will win. Whatever you fear more than God will, will rule your life. But if you really fear God, then you allow that condition to yield to the name of Jesus. And if you really know him, you will speak the name of Jesus with boldness. By the authority of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you in the name of, of Jesus. And you got to know it. you got to really command it. See, when you know him, you can speak with boldness, with authority. God says in Acts chapter number 1 and verse number 8, that I give you the power and authority to speak my name. The power. Acts number, number 1 and verse number 8. It says that fear is also a choice. It's a choice. We have a choice between power, love, and a sound mind. We can never choose fear over God. Never choose fear. Down south, uh, we were afraid of ghosts. <laughs> ghosts. There are a lot of ghost stories. And if you're in church and somebody says, oh, a ghost, the church, they would clear the church. 
<laughs> they would trample the ushers trying to get out to get out of there. Ghost stories down south. Anybody down south, you know what I'm talking about. My brother that you know was afraid of ghosts, and and uh, my dad used to make him try to go outside at night because <laughs> he was trying to get him to break this fear. So my dad one time I told him, he says, "Go ahead and uh, sweep sweep up uh, the stuff over here, sweep that dirt up, and just throw it outside in the back there." So he had to just sweep it up and just open the door and toss it out. <laughs> Couldn't do it. <laughs> the ghost was going to get him. And um, he swept, and I was thinking, now what is he going to do? So what he did was he swept it and put it under the rug. So my dad came back and said, did you sweep it up? I said, yes, sir. You throw it out? Yes, sir, I did. I said, he is lying. He is lying. <laughs> my dad said, really? Yes, sir. So what did my dad, he looked under the rug. And I don't remember anything after that. I just know it, <laughs> it wasn't good after that. We can do that with our sin. We can sweep it under the rug. You know, you know God wants you to face some situations right now. That's some things you need to face. But rather than facing and confronting you, because God wants you to put, and put you right to look at you, because this is not about anybody else. Your sin, your issue, your fear is about you. You can blame other people about your shortcomings or why you're not where you need to be, but ultimately, you have to face you. Because there's plenty of, go ahead, go ahead, give God glory. You have to face you. Because we like to blame somebody else about why we fall and why we fall short and why we're not who we need to be. But ultimately, if you took everybody away, you still have a problem. There's no one to blame. What do you do when there's no one else to blame? I had this messy roommate. He was so messy, stuff everywhere. The, the apartment, he was in the mirror, in the bathroom, his stuff spat over the mirror. Yeah, people like the stuff on the mirror, hair in the sink. You know, the kitchen was always a mess. I was thinking, I need a better roommate. And once he went on vacation, uh, Seattle, he went for a couple weeks on vacation, like, good, I can clean the place up now. And about a few days after he had went there, I was in the bathroom, and I saw there was stuff on the mirror. And there was stuff on the sink, and I went in the kitchen, the kitchen was a mess, and I'm thinking, how could he do that all the way from Seattle? How could he do that all the way from Seattle? This guy is good. Who do you blame when you don't have anybody else to blame? At some point, we've got to look at it and just be accountable for our part. Amen. Not for the whole thing, just, just your part. If you would just do your part, you'd be amazed how one part leads to another part. And it inspires other people. But if you would just handle your stuff, amazing how much things can change. It's just by doing your part. And oftentimes, God puts us in a position to where we are facing our part. What are you going to do with you? God, if you would just change, no, let's start by changing you. you. You pray for God to work on somebody else, and God says, yes, I'll get to them, but let me finish with you first. <laughs> let me just start with you. And, and once, you know, so when God works on you, some, some of those people are okay. No, I can, they're okay now, God. What'd you do? How'd you do that? You know, I like them now. It starts with us. When you have a difficulty accepting something in someone else, always look back at yourself, right? How can you tell your brother, let me remove the moat that is in, I mean, the, 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 it's in your eye, the splinter in your eye when there's a beam in our own eye, right? How can we talk about anybody else's shortcomings and weaknesses when we know that ours are many? We're not perfect, we're, we're just forgiven. That's all it is, we're just forgiven. And we, we shouldn't forget that God forgave us for us to be accepted by him, he first had to forgive us. All of our sins, all of our shortcomings, all of our weaknesses. And as he has forgiven us the same way we're to forgive one another. We forget that we were forgiven, right? Every one of us was, were forgiven at some point. And every day we should be repenting and ask God for forgiveness. Because every day we sin. Is that right? Some of you didn't agree with that. Huh? <laughs> what it means to fear God. To fear him does not mean that you're afraid of him. It's like with your parents. You know, you're afraid up to a certain point, but you find out that mom and dad were right. And there's no reason to really fear them. There's a respect that you have for them. And the thing that you do now to honor your parents, even though they may not be around anymore, you honor them. Or they may live in another part of the country, you still honor them because of a reverence for them that you have. So Exodus 18, 21, moreover, you should select from all the people 
able men such as fear God. Now here's what it means. Men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So when God looks for someone to fear him, he's looking for an honor, a respect. Your fear is that you will not fail God. You desire to live such a way that you know that in your, in your heart, in your mind, you know that you want to just do what pleases him. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. Let whatever I do today please you. And when you fall short, you really feel badly when you sin because you know that that just grieves the Holy Spirit when we do things we shouldn't do or say things we shouldn't say. I was around uh, kids when I was younger that used to curse in front of their parents or could, could get angry. Get angry in front of your parents. So walk off and their parents, come on, I'm talking to you and just walking off or slam the door. I could do that probably once. <laughs> <laughs> I could never get angry with my parents. So they say, you, are you upset? Are you mad? <laughs> you, had, you had no right to do that. I had no right. Smile. You don't try to smile when you got pain all over your face. That smile. You know. <laughs> I could not. Because even when they would whip you, you couldn't cry. You, you, I'll give you something to cry about. I'll say, what was that? What was all that? I give you something to cry. Better not cry. I don't know if you ever had parents like that. Better not cry. But that's how it was. But through that, I learned over time not to fear them. Not to fear them. I learned to really love and respect my parents. You know, none of us were perfect coming up. Is right. We got caught with some stuff. You know, they, got, they, they caught us with some stuff, right? But really be truthful. A lot of stuff you got away with. You got away with a whole bunch of stuff that they just didn't know about. And so when you got whipped sometimes you thought it was undeserved, maybe it was for some of the stuff that you thought you got away with. <laughs> maybe justice was being served. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. When you fear God, you hate what God hates. You love what God loves. And when you see something surfacing in you that God hates, you fear God because you know that God, help me to remove this what is within me. You're praying. That's your fear, that, you, that this will start to take control of your life. So if he hates evil, this is pride, arrogance, and the evil way in the perverse mouth I hate. The gateway, pride, fear, anger, lust, guilt, apathy. All those things are what Satan uses to try and keep us under bondage. Those are things we should fear more than fearing God. Because as those things control your life, they tend to just bring you down. They want to consume you. Do not fear. If you have a diagnosis, you don't have to fear. God's in control. And here's the, here's the thing that I, I've, I've, I faced after facing death a few times. Death of children and, and parents and people that were close to me. We're all going to go. Nobody makes it out alive. But here's the great thing about being a child of God. The Bible says that we will never see spiritual death. To be absent in this body means we're present with the Lord. Amen. Get this, get this. One day this old shell is going to pass away. But don't mourn because rejoice that I'm in the presence of God right now, right then. So there's no fear in anything that can happen down here what a person can do to you. Paul even said to live is Christ and to die is gain. That doesn't make any sense. He says if I live, I live for him. If I die, I get to be with him. So he recognized there was nothing to fear. There's nothing that anyone can take away from you that God cannot restore five, ten, a hundredfold. Don't fear the loss of what you can happen down here. Fear the loss that can happen in glory. There's nothing down here that matters that much. Our life is just a vapor, just a dust, a mist, the Bible says. Here today and you could be gone tomorrow. That's why you don't fear what can happen in this world. You know that at some point we all are going to be there. That's called that great getting up morning. The rapture can come and, and then the Bible says this, that, that this, this angel could blow the trumpet. 
and then we'd be all caught up to meet Jesus in the air. And we don't have to think about all the things down here, the pain, the struggles of this world, the hardships, all the people that talk about you, people that abandon you, the abuse that you've had to take. If we could just let it go. Let it go. Jesus says that I have borne your stripes, your iniquities. He nailed our sins on the cross. The Lord is your shepherd. Shall not fear. Though you walk through the valley, though you walk through the valley of the shadows of death, you fear no evil. Oh, that's good news. To be bold. Fear no evil because the Lord is with you. He says his rod and his staff, they comfort you. Your enemies, don't worry about them. He even says, pray for your enemies. Bless those who curse you and see all manner of evil about you. Those who persecute you and want to put you down. He says, I'll prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. If your enemy is hungry, what do you do? You feed him. First, to give him something to drink. He says, in that way, I'll make your enemies your footstool. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And surely goodness and mercy. Goodness and mercy. Those are twins. They follow you. Oh, you don't see them. But when you're following the shepherd, goodness and mercy is following you. Everything you're going after is coming after you when you're in God. Everything you could ever desire desires you. There's no fear about lack or, or missing what's, what's not there. God's got you. Goodness and mercy are following you all the days of your life. And ultimately, what we want from God, God just wants to be in your presence. When we come here on Sunday morning, your heart should be saying, I was so glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. As soon as these doors swing open, you walk into the presence of God. You walk into a place that you can meet God here. And then you can leave differently. When you leave here, you should feel like you've been in church. You should feel like you've been in the presence of God. And when you've surrendered everything here, when you really let go of everything, you'll walk out of here and other people can look at you and say, I don't know where you've been, but I want to go. I don't know who you know, but I want to know who you know. Ultimately, the world gets to know him through us. Amen.